Hey guys, it's Miss Craigle recording um, the one for fractures on chapter 62. And I've got the PowerPoint um, that we have in class. So I was just going to be sure and go over, be sure that we covered everything for you. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if you want to follow along in your book, I've got Lewis out, out chapter 62. Okay, so that we were going to compare and contrast um, risk factors of contusions, strains, sprains, um, dislocations, fractures. I want to make sure that we have covered all that. So um, we discussed how fractures of the disruption or break in a continuity of a structure of a bone. And the majority of fractures are from trauma. Some set fractures, of course, are secondary to disease. And we had a case study, LG, a 23-year-old man, brought to the emergency department following an injury to his right arm. And the bone in his forearm was protruding through his skin. And they immobilized it at the scene, and he rated his pain a nine. And by now, you guys have had your um, uh, scenario. So we also had a fracture scenario thing today, a simulation. So I hope you guys learned from that one too. How would you classify this one? This is an open fracture because the bone is protruding through the skin. It's most likely a complete fracture because the break is completely through the bone. It's also displaced. And so we classify bones according to their external environment as like the open fracture is open out into the environment. The closed fracture is still in the skin. The skin has not been interrupted and remains intact. A complete or incomplete fracture, a complete break is completely through the bone. An incomplete bone is still in one piece. I mean, an incomplete fracture, sorry. So um, a fracture is termed complete if a break is go as goes through the bone and incomplete if it occurs partly across the bone shaft, but the bone is still intact. An incomplete fracture is often the result of bending or crushing force applied to a bone. And it's based on the direction of the fracture line, linear, oblique, uh, transverse, longitudinal, or spiral. And we had some pictures for that. Pictures always made it more clear for me. The transverse is a fracture where the line goes um, a straight across. The spiral is the fracture where the line of the fracture extends in a spiral direction. The green stick is an incomplete fracture with one side splintered, the other side is bent. A comminuted fracture is a fracture with more than two fragments. The smaller fragments appear to be floating. Oblique fracture is a fracture where the line of the fracture extends into on oblique direction. And then pathological fracture is a spontaneous fracture at the site of a bone disease. The stress fracture is a stress fracture is a fracture that occurs in a normal or an abnormal bone that is subject to repeated stress, such as jogging or running. And see, there you go. That's why I don't jog and run. So I won't get one of those stress fractures on my foot. <laughs> no. Okay. Classifications, displaced or non-displaced. Displaced where two ends are separated from one another. And non-displaced, the, the periosteum is still intact and the bone is completely still in line. Usually like a transverse or spiral or green stick. Um, in a displaced fracture, the two ends are not are separated from one another and out of their normal positions. Displaced fractures are often comminuted. Um, in a non-displaced fracture, the periosteum is intact. And what other clinical things could we have uh, watched, assessed in um, our patient LG? Well, we could have assessed for decreased function, inability to use the arm, swelling and bleeding from the soft tissue damage. The clinical manifestations of a fracture include immediate localized pain, like what our patient had with our um, simulation that we did today, the decreased function and inability to bear weight on or use the affected part. The patient guards and protects the extremity against movement. Obvious bone deformities may not be present. If a fracture is suspected, the extremity is immobilized in the position of which it is found. Unnecessary movement increases soft tissue damage and may convert a closed fracture to an open fracture or create more injury by um, messing up the nerves and the blood vessels. Be sure and immobilize it if you suspect a fracture or if you're not sure. So LG asked how long it's gonna take for his bone to heal. So you can quickly review fracture healing so we can answer his questions better. And then we'll describe the six stages of bone healing. 
So those six stages of bone healing are fracture hematoma, where the fracture occurs, bleeding, it creates a hematoma that surrounds the fragments. So we talked about how, um, I talked about how I'd seen a hematoma, at, you know, in a hidden place on a patient, a hematoma is where the blood is collecting. It makes a, you can see it, something is swollen. And the blood there, the fracture occurs, it's right there at the end of the fragment. It occurs in the first 72 hours. The granulation tissue is active phagocytosis that absorbs the products of the necrosis. The hematoma converts into granula, granulation tissue and forms the basis for the new bone substance called an osteoid during three to 14 days after the injury. And then the callus formation, the ossification, consolidation, and remodeling. Remodeling is excessive bone tissue is reabsorbed in the final stage of the bone healing. Initially, stress is provided through exercise. Weight bearing is gradually introduced. And there's a picture of bleeding at fractured ends of the bone with subsequent hematoma formation. And factors that influence healing, um, many factors influence the time required for complete healing, including displacement, the time of the fracture, is the blood, if the area is getting good blood supply, if it's being immobilized, if it's got internal fixation devices like screws and pens, um, the ossification process can be slowed down or stopped by inadequate reduction and mobilization by excessive movement. Uh, if we get an infection in there, poor nutrition, if they have a, some kind of other disease, a systemic disease, healing time for fractures increases with age. And that is true because I just broke my tibia about two years ago and it took forever for it to heal. Smoking increases fracture time, healing time. Um, and I'm not a smoker. Fracture healing may not occur in the expected time or may not occur at all. So the complications of fracture healing are delayed union or non-union. Sometimes they have to refracture to, to get it lined up and get it back healing. So our goals of fracture treatment are anatomic realignment, immobilization, and restoration of normal or near normal function of our injured part. A closed reduction is a non-surgical alignment of the bone. And they can put traction or counter traction. They can do a local or general anesthesia and keep it immobilized. An x-ray confirms that our patient has a complete transverse break of its right radius, an oblique fracture of the right ulnar bone. He's scheduled to have immediate debridement and open reduction and repair. How do you explain this treatment? An open reduction is the correction of bone alignment through a surgical incision. It usually consists of um, wires, screws, pins, plates. And the main risk of this fracture management is the infection because we're going in there. Um, it facilitates early ambulation and decreases the risk of, of uh, complications related to prolonged immobility. Purpose is to decrease the pain in the muscle spasm, immobilize the joint. The purpose of traction is to decrease the pain in muscle spasm, immobilize joint, and reduce the fracture or dislocation, and to treat the condition. Traction devices apply a pulling force on the fracture to retain to attain alignment. The two most common types of, of traction are skin traction and skeletal traction. Skin traction is a short-term uh, traction like tape or boots or splints are applied directly to the skin. The traction weighs about five to 10 pounds and you do a skin assessment and prevent um, other skin breakdown. A Bex traction is a boot, a type of skin traction that is used to immobilize a fracture. It prevents hip flexion and hip flexion contractures and reduces uh, muscle spasm. And there's a picture of it. Skeletal traction is long-term um, pull to maintain alignment. It's generally in place for a long time. Um, it provides long-term pull. It keeps the injured bones and joints aligned. To apply skeletal traction, the surgeon has to insert a pin or a wire into the bone, and then the weights are attached to that pin to allow to align and immobilize the injured part. A weight for skeletal traction can range from 5 to 45 pounds. The use of too much weight can result in delayed union, of course. The major complication of a skeletal traction is infection at the pin site and the effects of prolonged immobility immobility. So when traction is used to treat fractures, the forces are usually exerted on the distal fragment to may obtain the alignment. One of the more common types of skeletal fraction is the balanced suspension traction. And there's a picture of that one. 
So proof of skeletal traction, we maintain alignment. Uh, the traction must be maintained continuously and keep the weights off the floor. So what type of immobilization would you expect our patient LG to get? He's most likely going to have a, a bivalve split cast wrapped in an ace bandage. This, this type of cast will allow us to visualize a surgical incision and kind of gives him a room for expansion for any potential post-op swelling. So a cast is a temporary immo immobilization device. Casting is a common treatment following closed reduction. It allows your patient to perform many normal activities of daily living. Also, it, it uh, ensures stability in immobilization. The cast generally incorporates the joints above and below the fracture. To apply a cast on an extremity, the affected part is first covered with a stockinette that's usually cut longer than the extremity, then place the, stock, the cotton padding over the stockinette. With the bony prominence, is given extra padding. If plaster of Paris is used, we immerse it in warm water and then wrap it and mold it around the affected part. The number of layers of the bandage and the technique determines the strength of the cast. Cast made of synthetic materials are being used more than plaster now because they're more lightweight and stronger, relatively waterproof and provide for weight bearing. Immobilization of an acute fracture or soft tissue injury is often accomplished by the sugar tong splint or the posterior splint, the short arm cast or the long arm cast. However, when a hanging arm cast is used for a humerus fracture, elevation is contraindicated because hanging provides traction. When a sling is used, be sure that the axillary, axillary area is well padded because that skin underneath your arm can really get excoriated and uh, with direct direct skin to skin contact. Vertebral immobil immobilization, they use a body jacket brace Injuries to the lower extremities are often immobilized by a long cast or a short leg cast, depending on the injury. And after the application of a lower extremity cast or dressing, the extremity should be elevated above your heart for the first 24 hours. After our cast is applied, we observe for signs of compartment syndrome, increased pressure, especially in the heel, and the head of the fibula. This increased pressure is manifested by pain or continual burning in these areas. A prefabricated knee and ankle splint and immobilizers are used in many settings. Depending on your injury, removal of the splint can return to function um, faster. The hip, um, this is a hip spica cast is now mainly used for femur fractures in children. Here's some common pictures of some common cast. The short arm cast, the long arm cast. An external fixation is when we use metal pins and rods and apply traction to that. It immobilizes and holds the fractures in place. There's a picture of external fixation. External fixation is often used in an attempt to salvage an extremity. Infection, we have to really watch for infection, may require removal of the device. So instruct the patient about keeping it, really keeping those pins really clean and watching for good pin care. Although each physician has a protocol for pin care, be sure and tell them how to clean those pins when they go home. Internal fixation devices, pins, plates, and rods and screws are surgically inserted. And there's just an example of some pins. An electrical bone growth stimulator is used to facilitate the healing process. It works uh, by, by uh, increasing the Activating, let's see. It, work, it works by electronic, electromagnetic fields to generate a weak electrical current. The electrodes are typically in a band applied over the skin or the cast and worn. So a case study, what type of medicine would we expect the healthcare provider to order for LG? So we expect him to order some analgesics, pain medicine, antibiotics, we don't want him to get an infection. And sometimes I'll go ahead and give him antibiotics to keep, keep that from happening. Today on our simulation, our patient got Rosepin and they ordered him some muscle relaxants and a tetanus shot. Patients with fractures experience varying degrees of pain associated with muscle spasms. Um, the threat of tetanus from an open fracture can be reduced by giving a tetanus shot. And bone, bone penetrating antibiotics such as the cephalosporins 
are used prophylactically before surgery. So what are they gonna teach him about his nutritional needs? An adequate energy source is needed to promote muscle strength and tone and build endurance. The patient's dietary requirements must include good protein and calcium and vitamins and phosphorus and magnesium to ensure op uh, optimal healing. Obtain the following um, health information from a client to do when we're doing our nursing assessment. Do a past health history, um, get the medications if you can, any kind of surgeries that they've had. Obtain the following important information if you can. Um, have like health perception, activity, um, any kind of sensation that they've had, loss, any kind of chronic pain, and then perform a very focused physical assessment. You know, on a general assessment would include like, uh, are they guarding the site? Are they are they anxious? The integumentary would look at the for skin lacerations. Like today, our, our patient had a fracture on his left leg and a laceration on his right leg. Look at the color of his skin. Is it blue? Is it pink? Is it pallor? Is it very pale? Has he got pulses? Has he got swelling? He should have a, we don't want him to have absent pulses um, by the injury. We want him to still be getting blood flow to the area. Um, check the neurovascular. Um, can he have, do they have any feeling in that, in that spot? Musculoskeletal, has he lost complete loss function or does he have a little bit of function? And we are diagnostic. We talked about a little bit diagnostic stuff. Um, uh, the things that help us make our diagnosis for our patients. So we would do um, an X-ray on him, a bone scan, a CT scan, or an an or an MRI. Okay. So his surgeon has written an out an order for hourly neuro checks here, and how we're gonna um, what do we assess when you do a neuro check? Well, peripherally, you do your color and temperature of your limb, of your fingers, of your foot. You check for capillary refill. Remember how to do that in your assessment. You can match on there um, and watch the blood flow come back under their nail. Pulses, they have pulses. Are they equal? Are they um, the same on both sides? Are they present? How about swelling? You, uh, musculoskeletal injuries have the potential for causing changes in the neurovascular status. So we can assess the ulnar, the median, the radial nerve function, have them move their fingers if they can. Some of our nursing diagnoses that we might use are impaired physical mobility or risk for peripheral neurovascular dysfunction. Acute pain is usually always, of course, with an injury and readiness for enhanced health management. The overall goals we're gonna have are that our patient We'll have healing with no complications, of course, have some pain relief and achieve the maximum rehab, get his, uh, hopefully he can get his full function of his limb or back to back what it was. Teaching people in the community to take appropriate safety precautions while they're uh, to prevent some injuries at home or work. Be an advocate for personal actions like seat belts and speed limits, distracted driving, warming up your muscles before you exercise. So every time that we see these people in the, like an ER or clinic, always just talk to them, try to give them some information about safety in ways like that. Um, specify nursing measures, depending on the setting. If a surgical intervention is, intervention is required to treat a fracture, they will need pre-op um, preparation. In addition, they'll inform them of the type of immobilization and devices that are used and that might be used. Assure them that the staff will help them with their personal needs until they can do it themselves and remind them that we're going to have pain medicine for them. For post-operative care in general, post-operative care is directed toward monitoring the vital signs and applying the general principles of post-op care. Closely monitor any limitations they have, pain and discomfort, and be sure your neuro checks, your neurovascular assessments are getting done. Check for pulses. Carefully observe the dressing or cast for any sign of bleeding or drainage. Other measures um, that give you complications in immobility is constipation. We can give them um, stool softeners. We can include if they can drink. Okay, we can encourage fluid intake. Um, Prevent constipation by increasing patient activity as they can, a high fluid diet, and less contraindicated, a diet high in bulk and roughage, like fruits and vegetables. 
um, a regular time to go to the bathroom. Renal calculi can develop from bone demineralization related to reduced mobility. So the hypercalcemia from the demineralization can cause a rise in our urine pH and stone formation. So we can increase the, that, the increase in the fluid intake will help with that as well. Um, unless contraindicated, these effects of uh, the effects of the cardiopulmonary system um, can be diminished by having them sit on the side of the bed for a minute when they start to get up and having them performing standing and transfer when your patient is allowed to, to increase activity and assess for orthostatic hypotension. That's when we set them up too fast and their blood pressure will drop and they get dizzy. We don't want them to fall, of course. When slings are used, we regularly inspect the exposed skin areas. Persistent skin pressure can impair blood flow and cause injury. We can observe the traction. Be sure we always check the pin sites for infection. That's mentioned in every paragraph just about. Pin site care may vary, it includes regular cleansing with chlorhexidine, rinsing the pin sites with saline and drying the area. They keep mentioning that because it's so important for your patient not to get an infection because it really does, if they really do get into that infection, then the pin will have to come out. So then he will even be a slower getting healed. So he recuperates well, our patient LG, and is scheduled for discharge. What are we gonna teach him about the cast? We're gonna teach him that uncomplicated fractures are treated in an outpatient setting, regardless of the cast material. Cast can interfere with circulation if it's too tight or because of swelling. We're gonna explain the importance of elevating the extremity above the heart to, perform, to uh, promote venous return. We can put ice on it if it gets some swelling. Or if it's itching real bad, you can tell them about a hairdryer set on cool instead of poking something down in there to scratch the itching spot. A lot of people do that and they, make it, they can get an infection that way. Report signs of possible problems to the doctor, increased pain, um, despite, your, despite putting ice and elevating it, a swelling, um, more pain and more tingling, a foul odor. If you suspect compartment syndrome, don't elevate it above the heart. Don't get the plaster cast wet if you can help it. Don't bear weight on it for 48 hours. Don't cover it with plastic for a long, long time. Validate the understanding of these instructions before discharge. How would we do that? How do we validate? You know, kind of get them, get them, catch them at a good time to talk and let them tell you. Um, now, do you remember how many hours we said uh, to keep your cast elevated? Or do you remember what we talked about? How to, you know, how can we elevate it? And um, how can, what's a reason that we would tell you to come back to the doctor? Yeah, you know, just kind of have a two-way conversation there with them. Short-term goals address the transition from dependence back to independence. Encourage them, they're gonna get better. And um, helping them know, know the goals, the, the physical therapy, they end up having to have physical therapy to get full function back. When they begin to ambulate, uh, know the patient's weight bearing status and the correct technique if they're having to use a device like a walker or crutches or a boot. And um, devices for ambulation range from a cane that can relieve up to 40% of the weight to a walker, to crutches. Expected outcomes are that they will report um, pain, problems with pain or any kind of infection signs, of course, uh, edema, open fractures and um, soft tissue injuries have the highest incidence of infection. Compartment syndrome is the condition in where the swelling has caused so much increased pressure within a limited space that the fascia surrounding it has limited ability to stretch. And continued swelling can cause so much pressure that will compromise the function of the blood flow. Compartment syndrome usually involves the leg but can occur in any muscle group. The two basic causes of it are decreased, uh, decreased compartment size resulting from restrictive, a restrictive dressing or splint or cast or traction that was too tight. Edema can create um, sufficient pressure to obstruct circulation. It can occur initially from the physiologic response of the body to the injury. Ischemia can occur 48 hours after the onset of the compartment syndrome. So we don't want the area to lose blood flow and then it would lose, you know, it will die that area around that. We don't, we've got to really completely do good assessments on our patients and check their pulses, check the color of their skin. One or more of the following six P's are characteristic of compartment syndrome, pain out of proportion to the injury, um, increased pressure, uh, paresthesia, which is the num num numbness and tingling, pallor, which is very, very pale or coolness, loss of normal color, 
paralysis or loss of function, pulselessness. So be careful when someone's saying, well, I'm really having a lot of pain. Be careful and not be like, yeah, you are. You just had surgery. I mean, check out what kind of pain. Um, is it related? Have you given them pain medicine lately? Be sure and check it out. A prompt, accurate diagnosis of compartment syndrome is critical because you can get ischemia in four hours, right? Elevation of the extremity may lower the venous pressure. Surgical decompression is involved. Infection re results from delayed wound closure is a potential problem. So we really have to watch out for infection and do all we can um, so we don't give them, an, or let them, hopefully we can keep them from having an infection. Fat embolism is characterized by fat globules from the fractures that are distributed in the, in the tissues, lungs, and other organs. A contributory factor in mortality associated with fractures. The fractures that most often are associated with fat embolism are the long bones and the ribs, the tibia, and the pelvis. These can also occur after a total joint replacement, um, a crushing injury, or a bone marrow transplant. Two theories about fat embolism exist. According to the theory, the mechanical theory is that fat embolisms can originate from the fat that is released from the marrow of the injured bone. The biochemical theory says that the hormone changes caused by the trauma um, stimulate the release of these uh, fatty acids that form the embolus. Early recognition is the main thing, whatever causes it is early recognition is crucial to preventing a potential lethal course. Most patients will manifest a symptom within 24 to 48 hours after the injury. Severe forms have occurred within hours. Fat embolus in the lungs can cause a hemorrhagic pneumonitis with signs and symptoms of acute respiratory distress, such as chest pain, cyanosis, um, hard to breathe, apprehension, tachycardia. These symptoms are caused by poor oxygen exchange. They can also have a change in mental status as a result from being hypoxic. Investigate any kind of memory loss they have. Investigate um, the head, if they have a real bad headache. Um, Petechiae are located on the, on the neck and chest wall. Can help distinguish a fat embolism from another problem. The clinical course of a fat embolism can be rapid and fast, acute. Frequently, the patient will experience a feeling of impending doom. No specific lab is available to help you diagnose this. However, certain diagnostic abnormalities may be present. Uh, you might see some fat cells in their blood, their urine, their sputum. You might see a decrease in their PaO2. Um, a chest x-ray may show uh, pulmonary in infiltrates in their x-ray. The treatment is directed at prevention. So careful immobilization and handling of long bone fractures is probably the very most important factor in preventing fat embolism. Reposition the patient as little as possible before the fracture immobilization. Management of fat embolism is mostly supportive and related to the management of the system. And treatment includes fluid, fluid resuscitation to prevent hypovolemic shock and replacement of any blood loss if they lost a lot of blood. Encourage coughing and deep breathing. Remember we talked about showing on how to use that incentive spirometer. Some patients may develop um, pulmonary edema or both and ARDS leading to an increased mortality rate. And here was a question we went over, a plaster splint, a spl a plaster splint applied with an elastic bandage to the leg of a patient with a fractured tibia. The patient complains of increasing pain that is not relieved after we loosen his bandages. Um, and it says the answer, it says the most appropriate action by us on this question is to apply ice Prompt, accurate diagnosis of compartment syndrome is critical. Prevention and early recognition is the key. Okay, so let us let is see if we have covered everything. I also have that other PowerPoint in case you just want to keep on reading. No, I just say things differently. So we talked about, oh yeah, we talked about um, phantom pain. Um, even if they have an amputation, they can still feel pain. Um, you know, and if they, we talked about what, what if they're wanting pain, uh, pain medicine for their leg and you walk in there and they don't have a leg and then you still give them pain medicine because they have phantom pain and that's a very real thing. And so we go ahead and give them 
And especially if it's like the day they had their amputation or the day after they were telling you they're in severe pain, they're missing their leg, they're missing their hand, they're missing their foot. Um, first, what are we going to do first? We're going to give them pain medicine and get their pain medicine under control. And then if you want to do some teaching about phantom pain, all those things we talked about, yes. But immediately when they just had it done and they're, and they're telling you they're in severe pain, remember, are they going to listen to your teaching? No, they just want their pain to be better. So we're going to give them some pain medicine. That's what we need to do. And then if they had to, um, you know, back up a little bit, they haven't had their amputation. They have uh, those pins several times in the book, several times in the PowerPoint in our reading. It keeps on saying, be sure and make sure that the pin insertion sites are clean daily, daily clean them um, with that clarohexidine. Be sure there's no signs of infection. Be sure and tell your patient how important that is. It really is important to involve them in their care, like their care plan or tell them why we have to keep these pins clean. You know, I had a teenage girl smart off one time and tell me she wasn't going to do all that stuff because it was my job, not her job. Well, I had to tell her it's her body and I'm not going to go home with her. And if she gets an infection, then she'll be back in the hospital. So sometimes we have to, you know, really explain things to them so that they can think about when I get home, I really, this is why it's like, it's very, very important if I take my medicine correctly or if I keep this clean. We talked about um, some sprains and strains and like when we, when we get a, an injury from doing the same um, repetitive motion, like if we hurt our back because we're not bending our knees and then you, you treat your patient for his back and then you say, okay, when you, when you go home, you're going to have to do, or when you go back to work, you're going to have to need to change the way you're doing this, or you're going to have the same kind of injury. So we would change him to help him discuss the ways that would modify so he wouldn't keep getting the, you know, the same kind of injury. And then we talked about, oh, oh, we went over all those objectives. Let's see. We talked about um, when, when we give them, uh, when they are MPO, telling them why they're MPO is very important. And when they can start eating, you know, they need to have their diet that's high in protein and um, they need to be sure and have eat healthy three times a day if they can. And be sure a lot of the medicine that the doctors will put them on, especially if they put them on like an NSAID, like a uh, ibuprofen or some kind of an anti-inflammatory medicine, those have to be taken with food. So there's lots of patient teaching as far as that, you know, when you go home, you got to take your medicine, you know, and be sure that um, this medicine needs to be taken with food. And if they go home, if they go home with the pens, we be sure and talk to them about keeping their pens clean. Of course, we talk to them about, okay, if, if they, they, if they get an infection, they need to come back to the doctor and you need to talk to them about what, what is an infection? What would it look like on my leg? What would it look like on my arm? Is it going to hurt? Is it going to, you know, sometimes you'll get some swelling, you'll get a red area. You get a, sometimes you'll have some, uh, uh, some uh, drainage, excudate, they call it, or uh, maybe a foul odor, maybe a red line, maybe some kind of, but you'll see some, uh, teach them if their temperature gets up like 101, 102, what, what's their temperature? What's the bad temperature? When do I come to the doctor? What, you know, what, how am I gonna know if I'm having an infection or not? So, um, if they do have a fracture, we're gonna check all their pulses and things like that. It's really important to um, talk about um, their history on what they eat and, and being, if they do, um, if they don't need to drink enough fluids, um, be sure that tell them why it's important to drink so much fluids. If they smoke, be sure and tell them um, smoking can even make your um, healing slower. And they're going to say, well, how can that? Remember how we talked about how that can slow things down? That um, nicotine makes the calcium not absorb as much as it can. So you know, at least, you know, maybe you're not going to cure somebody who's smoking if they smoke their whole, whole life. But if you could say it makes the calcium not absorb and help you heal as fast. So maybe you could cut down on your cigarettes or cut down on your smoking a little bit. And that would probably help you quite a bit on your healing. So um, things like that. Be sure and make sure that they have a 
know when to come back to the doctor if they have pain that doesn't get better. If um, be sure that we talk to them about infection, we talk to them about um, taking their medicine correctly. We talk to them about well, how did you hurt yourself? Well, I was carrying. Well, you don't understand. I have a job where I have to lift all these boxes. Well, how do you lift them? Or this, you don't understand. I have a box. Uh, job where I have to reach over my head and do my arm like this. Well, then how do you do your arm? Well, maybe you help, maybe you can help him think of a way to actually change the way that they pick up things or the way that they move things or they're going to have the same kind of injury again. So um, anyway, just any kind of thing that you can think of to help your patient get better faster. I know you'll do that. Okay, well, I think you guys are doing really good. Um, and if you have any questions before the test, be sure and holler at me. All right, I hope you have a good evening and get some rest. Bye. I think I did it. I think I just got through the recording. <laughs> good, how are you doing? Good, I thought I'd come back and say hello since I was sleeping. Good. I thought that smells so good out there. What do you put? The it's a new disinfecting that I like ordered. Oh, do you like it? Yes. I can use it for an uh, odor deluminator. It disinfects and it leaves a really nice clean smell. And I use it on everything. Where do you order but it from? From here. I mean, you order. Oh. Yeah. Let me give you a bottle. Yes. It smells so good. One lady has a scenty thing that. Um, not, not a scenty thing. Those I things that spray bottles. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, is it okay to bring you time? I'm, yes, I'm going no, through so much. I love it. Yeah. Okay. And I got my sister. Good. Because when I can't fill in, yeah. she will be able to. Okay. So you're fine. Well, I'm, I've been saving. I've got you're my whole clothes for my whole life. <laughs> okay, good. Like, oh, I'm going to keep this disgrace. My, my family knows I'm so bad about. Um, the problem is, is I don't want to hide it from my.